Welcome to the Kryptonaut Podcast presents Evil Science and Magic Buddies, the show within the show, the conspiracy of the conspiracies, the Crypto Roundtable. I am Mark Storrs, and with me as always is Rob Morphy. We are so very happy today to be joined by Krista Alexander. Krista, thank you so very much for joining us. Welcome to the Dive Bar of Paranormal slash UFOlogy Podcasts. Thanks, guys. <laughs> that was so spot on, it, it scared me a little. I can smell like the bathroom door isn't shut right. Yeah. And the beer's getting funky on tap. To, but thank uh, you. Yes, Krista, for joining to us. To be it's fair, when, awesome. I first, uh, when I first contacted Krista, well, actually, well, she contacted us, and then I got a hold of her and was like, hey, just so you know, this is the kind of show we have. We're kind of cavemen, so like, I don't want to ruin your career in any way, shape, or form. And then she listened to some episodes, and she was like, yeah, no, this is cool. I was like, yes, perfect. So, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, and course. yeah, Robert, you got a little, got some things you're going to say here, buddy? Absolutely. Um, so let's just set up a little bit of background for our listeners. Uh, Krista has a master's degree in communication and media management and a bachelor's degree in humanities. She is a U.S. Army combat veteran who had served 15 months in Iraq as a broadcast journalist. So she is vetted. She comes from a world of legitimate journalism. And at some point in the not too distant past, she came across a mystery and did what you would hope all good journalists would do. And that is not turn a blind eye because the, the mass of culture thinks that something is either foolish or ridiculous, but look at what's really happening and try to break it down. And so, Krista, I'm going to bring it to you now to tell us a little bit about what it is that you stumbled across and why you got interested and what made you become, spoiler alert, a documentarian. Yeah, you know, it is actually my first documentary. So I guess I can actually say that now, which is pretty awesome. Um, but basically, it happened kind of innocently enough. I live in Colorado. And in January, uh, just a few months ago, people were hearing about these lights that were flying over farms and the plains of Colorado, and everybody was calling them drones. So it was all over news. People were making a big fuss of it. I've always been interested in, like, I guess, paranormal type stuff. So as soon as I heard about, uh, you know, mysterious lights in the sky, I wanted to go check it out. So me and my family, we go driving out to the Colorado plains, and I see these lights in the sky. There's three in a row. They look, kind of look like stars, but they're a little too low. And then one by one, they slowly fade out until they disappear. Nothing crazy, but enough for me to be like, okay, what's up with that, right? So hmm. I go home. I join a Facebook group about the drones in the sky. Uh, the name has changed quite a bit, but at, at first it was like drones over Colorado or something like that. So I, jo I joined this group. And people are posting photos and videos of these lights every single night. And everyone is just really freaking out. It, it kind of just blows up. But nobody knows what it is. And then soon the FBI starts to get involved. The local news station is going out there. The local sheriff station is going out there. People are starting to get pissed off, right? They want to go shoot the lights because they think it's some sort of like government conspiracy. <laughs> that was one right? of my favorite parts, by the way. <laughs> I know. It's like, really, you think that the government is like, obviously, why would the government have a drone with a big light on it shining on your farm in the <laughs> middle of nowhere a, colorado <laughs> to make it the perfect target yeah. there you yeah. go <laughs> <laughs> so i was like i have i have editing equipment i kind of i've been in video production for 15 years you know so i have my own editing equipment and i was like i'm just gonna download the video i'm gonna zoom in all I'm going to do is adjust the brightness and the contrast. Nothing crazy. I'm not going to touch color or anything. I just want to see what it is. You know, honest, genuine curiosity. So I zoom in and I see what it is and my heart just stops and my stomach twists and I freak out. I mean, so to speak. And I try, <laughs> I, I throw something together as quickly. I, I mean, within minutes, I'm exporting what I found and I'm uploading it into the Facebook group. And I'm like, oh my God, guys, look at this. Right. And I'm thinking everyone's going to be as excited as I am. But instead, everyone just starts like <laughs> hating me and like harassing me and calling me crazy. So I start to get even more adamant to prove I'm not crazy. Like I'm really seeing something here, right? <laughs> so I start doing right. more and more and more videos. And the more videos I do, the more stuff I found. 
and it got to the point where I found things that were so crazy that um, I, I mean, I, it sounds kind of crazy, but I really couldn't <laughs> sleep or eat for like five days. I couldn't think about anything else. It completely changed my life. I, I couldn't look at the world the same anymore. I couldn't look at reality the same anymore. It was, um, sh- it was a shock. And I went through this period of shock, you know? Um, well, so I well, contacted, yeah. go ahead. No, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but when anyone has a sort of paradigm shift, it, you, it is almost like you're going through both the shock of the newness of this new perspective and uh, and, and the morning of, I suppose, a former, more, um, less challenged perspective. So I can totally get that feeling. But uh, but what I'm curious about is obviously the people in this face, uh, Facebook group believe something anomalous was up there, be it, you know, government drones or whatever. So what was it that made them so taken aback and probably literally intimidated by this different perspective that you had? You know, they weren't, I wouldn't say maybe their, their core, their core emotion was intimidation or or fear, but their uh, expression of that was anger. And they were just attacking me in really ruthless ways. And it was, that was really hard for me too. you know, to go through that. Um, and, I, and none of them really thought it was UFOs. I don't think anybody wanted to say it was the UFO word. Because if you say the word UFO, I mean, you, you're you setting yourself up to be just, you lose all credibility. I mean, really. That's true. Yeah. So everybody was saying it was drones, 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 drones. I mean, the, the Facebook title group was drones, right? And so here I come and I'm like, that's not drones. And everybody just, you know, like, uh, goes crazy. I sent the, I sent all, I wrote this, I write for Quora, Quora.com. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. And I was pretty, uh, on it a lot. So I quickly wrote a little article for my followers there and I sent my images and my video to a local news station and they wrote back and they said, uh, this doesn't amount to news for us. And I was like, well, that's really interesting because this is the evidence uh, this is evidence. You know, how, how could this not be news? So I and write it, it back was and I say, huge news. It, uh, yes. Yes. It, yes. It, 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 like national news, like the, the Colorado drones, quote unquote, were such a big deal. So to suggest that a, a different take on it from an experienced journalist is not news really see, it smacks of the shadiness of media culture when it comes to uh, breaking new ideas or anything ufological in general. Yeah. It was extremely suspicious, right? So I email her back and I said, listen, in my head, I was thinking, I just need somebody else to look at this video and say, this isn't some sort of technical malfunction. And if these digital journalists at a local, you know, credible news source could confirm that, then that could really help me. So Mm -hmm. I emailed her and I said, hey, can you let me know if what is in these videos are um, digital, you know, technical issues? And she writes me back and she says... This is beyond their expertise. <laughs> really? Really, quote unquote. Oh, man. And so <clears throat> I, 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 I reached out to one of the guys. I, I, um, one of the videos I edited was from a man named Steve Barone who lives out in Las Vegas. So I, I reached out to him and I was like, man, I like my world is going upside down. Like I have this information and I don't know what to do. You know, do you have any advice? And he was like, First off, you need to be really, really careful with the UFO world because it's some crazy stuff going on in there, right? And then he said, mm-hmm. secondly, news, uh, mainstream media, they will not report this. They won't. And so at that moment, I was like, I, I'm going to have to create a documentary. It's the only way. And so I did. There you that's go. That's awesome. Take it head yeah. on. Yeah, that's that's the way to do it is when you're trying to get your information out there and nobody wants to hear it, just say, you know what, I'm just going to do it myself. And then there it is. You know, it's, it's interesting, too, because, you know, by adjusting the I mean, most any time there's any evidence or, or, you know, any type of whether it's paranormal or ufology, any type of video evidence, the first thing that generally people do is they'll put it into like Adobe Premiere and they will adjust contrast to look at it to see, OK, can I see anything else here? So it's not like you're out there doing some crazy stuff. You're just like, yeah, I adjusted the contrast of it. did, you know, the brightness, the contrast kind of a, 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 to see what's there. And then you found something and you show it. And then all of a sudden everybody, you know, gets all weird and up in arms. It's not like you're doing something super crazy out of the ordinary, you know, no, definitely especially not. in this field, like you're just checking it out. And then, but yeah, unfortunately some people are not very receptive to it. So, and well, to, to uh, be ob- fair. obviously, yeah, it's, you know, it, it changes, it changes the quality, right? 
if you mm -hmm. play with the brightness and the contrast, especially if you're filming on a cell phone video, you're going to have high pixelation. Mm -hmm. right. So when people see that, especially people who aren't familiar with technology and editing and things like this, when people see that, they just go, I call them purists. And, and that's my nice way of calling them. <laughs> um, if, if it's not exactly how it came across on the original mm -hmm. video recording, then it's, then it needs to be thrown out the window. It's no longer right. evidence. It's completely worthless. So I loved it when I did some research. I was like, what are you talking about? It's worthless. Like, this is the best we can do, you know? So I do some research on it. And this guy who works over at NASA, pretty high ranking, he wrote this entire opinion piece talking about how sick and tired he is of people complaining that the images they get of the nebulas and the galaxies and the universe, people complain about it because it's because they because because the uh, I guess the NASA guys, they affect the brightness and the contrast. And so, yeah. they're like, well, that's not real. It's not real anymore when you do that. And he's like, what are you talking about? That's like the best way we can see what's going on. We can see its behavior. We can see what's going right. on. And so <laughs> it would, I love finding it, that. It's true. It would yeah. literally be like taking any National Geographic special from our childhood to today and saying, if you're shooting these lions in night vision, these cats are not fucking real. There's no yes. such thing as a lion. <laughs> yes, There's no exactly. such thing as a savanna. Yeah. I don't even believe that tree is there because you have modified <laughs> what I would see. What I want to see is pitch black and then die in the maws of a giant beast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I do not it, trust right. the improvement technology has made. No, I agree. There's a huge, there is a huge difference, a spectrum of difference between manipulating and or photoshopping or outright faking through CGI, which obviously happens all too often these days and it's something we all need to be aware of, and just using the technology we have to enhance or to uh, just further illuminate a section of something that, I mean, because human beings, this is something you also indicated fascinatingly in your documentary, is that uh, we, we have a very limited spectrum with which we can see. You know, we don't even have what animals, almost all the animals surrounding us have access to, much That's less right. birds and insects. So so I find that any, any, any digital manipulation that is used to enhance does not discredit uh, the veracity of the original footage. And I say footage because I'm old and live in an analog world, but yeah, the yeah. video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I to think, be fair, um, I say film still, so you're good. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Great. So I, die hard. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So you two can have your film club, and don't worry, I'll be over here in 4K land enjoying yeah. high-quality Star Wars <laughs> yeah. films on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, I think that uh, a, a big problem, too, obviously, you're talking about with the pixelation. People don't necessarily understand when you're dealing with digital video that you can break it down almost to the pixel. You're, but that pixel is reflective of what is there. It was filmed. That's so exactly even right. though even though it might get a little bit grainy looking, you're still getting a representation of it. And I'm sure that there is film there. Well, not film nerds, but digital, you know, nerds across the spectrum that are going to completely disagree with it or, but whatever. I mean, it is there. You are adjusting it. It's like if you get a photo and you zoom in on it, on someone's eye and you get the pixelization of it, it's still an eye. It's just, you know, it's, it's still pixelized. an eye. Yeah. yeah and exactly. You know, one so. of my, my personal loves is um, psychology and sociology and my degree program actually has a lot to do with understanding how people think more for propaganda issues. Right. But, uh, right. Understanding how people, oh, cool. I don't, yeah. You know, you just and, branded yourself now. You are a government shill you know who's trying to taint us to thinking that's did not we get, an ET did craft. We, it's something else. Did we yeah, somehow no. land a misinformation agent on our show? Is that what happened? Hey, it's no, our first. If it is, no. it's our first, and I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, of course hey, not. Don't get me wrong. I think this is great. I'm all about Just it. Just what a misinformation agent would say, Krista. <laughs> well, you know, all marketing, as a side note, all marketing is propaganda. Oh, uh, 100%. No matter what yeah, it totally. is. No matter what yeah. it is. Especially when it's really blatant and they don't try to hide it. It's like, really? I'm not that dumb. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, and, you know, and a lot of people are. A lot of it's subconscious, right? Basically, oh, the totally. root the root of propaganda, the root of marketing, the root of, um, of any sort of communication is understanding people's emotions. And so really to be a good communicator, you have to understand how people think. And that's really – I took that and I really made sure to um, – to look at that from that perspective. So when people start getting angry with me, when people start telling me that I need to go see a psychologist, um, I, I start kind of dissecting, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? And I think a lot of their feelings are fear. They're afraid. And the further I've gone down this road 
the more I've realized a lot of people, a lot of people are afraid. And it's, um, it's, it's kind of sad and it's inhibitive because it really prevents us from really trying to understand what these lights are, you know, because people just want to sit in the dark in their rooms and pretend like it doesn't exist. That's true. Yeah, totally. And let this let this be the point where we lead into actually what it is that you you seem to have found, and it's very compelling. And that is something uh, that you refer to as intelligent light. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you actually saw in this uh, alleged drone videos, this mass of videos that weren't taken from a single source, that were just being uploaded to this Facebook site from various sources? And and how you manage? We know we we we've discussed a little how you managed to dig into it a little bit with your you know top of the line software. But tell us now what you found. So the first video I found, um, it, it wasn't anything spectacular, but it was enough for me to say there's something here. This isn't normal. So um, the first video I found where it was really just kind of like you say spectacular and it kind of changed my worldview was Steve Barone's video. And he caught amazing footage over Las Vegas, which is known, you know, kind of close to Area 51 and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was this um, this light in the sky and a lot of ufologists actually looked at this light and they immediately discounted it and said it was a helicopter for some crazy reason, because it definitely does not look like a helicopter in any way. I find that suspicious. Yeah, totally suspicious. We, you know, obviously Mark and I saw it in your documentary, which we will talk about when it's released. It's not available yet, but you gave us access to it a little early so we could uh, have some basis for this conversation. And the footage he took is so astonishing to me. Oh, my God. I know. And, I know. and, and I love it. And what's intriguing to me on a personal note <clears throat> is it's very reminiscent. And I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole too deep, but of something that I saw while I was driving with my sister for a, a stay in Florida in the 91 we're like really early 90s and uh and hovering over these houses approximately 12 feet up at an angle were two very similar lights uh bluish and red slightly larger in the blue and we watched it we actually stopped in the throughway or highway or whatever it is in pennsylvania in the commonwealth there and watched it arc across a neighborhood until it faded into the distance maybe somewhere between 10 and 20 feet but i think closer to like 15 12 feet above these houses hmm. And I, I found that really that's all right. So we'll package that and put it away. But the footage yeah. uh, that he took is of something very incredible. And 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 it's there whether or not it's tangible. It's it really seems like it's something that is it's hard to say physically there, but there in, in a way that we are able to observe it and record it. Yeah, it's definitely not a helicopter. The way that it moves like if it was a helicopter, you would be able to see at least a rotor at some point, yeah, or something. But there's nothing. It's just this light, that, and it moves very erratically too. At, at one point, so yeah, I don't see why people would think it's a helicopter. But and I think you know. that's an interesting conversation to have. You know, is why were these respectable ufologists saying it was a helicopter? What's go- what's up with that? You know that that deserves some investigation right there. Yeah, I, I'm. I guess we'd have to actually see like what their you know like report on it was. But just looking at the video from what I saw, I would not. You know, and I am obviously not a ufologist. Um, but yeah. just looking at it, I, I mean, I don't. Rob, did you get any hint of it being a helicopter? I didn't see. I mean, I didn't see anything that looked like a rotor or yeah. any any form that even at a distance resembled what I recognize to be a helicopter, which is a pretty uh, well-known shape. Uh, so no, <laughs> yes. but, but it, it is not know, Airwolf, Robert. Yeah. It's not Airwolf. Don't worry. It could have been Blue Thunder. Don't take it away oh, from me. Okay. I mean, the only I, I guess the only thing with a helicopter possibly is if you're like, okay, yeah, there was a light or something, you know, bouncing off of it. But I mean, th- at that point, you're getting into like no, the JFK it was assassination. It was like, self illuminated. Exactly. You're, well, oh, yeah. you're right exactly. about that. I'm yeah, sorry. This exactly. is what happens so. when we do this remotely. Mark and I talk over each other a lot. Our audience is used to it. Just forgive us, Krista. It's no, because we, we, we can't look into each other's baby blues and browns and just know when it's time for the other to speak. I know. Nice. I know exactly what you mean. I'm kind of like uh, socially awkward on, on on phones and stuff. So I, I, I know what you mean. I have to see people's faces. Yeah, uh, you yeah. definitely need the cues. But, but let me put on my Uncle Rob tinfoil hat for a minute and say this. It has been clear um, you know, obviously, Dr. Stephen Greer and, and other people that are in the field 
uh, have made it clear that, and, and we know this, that there are high ups in, in the media, in newspapers and television that are full time employees of the CIA. This is not, I'm not like bringing out a news flash here. Anyone that listened to this stuff knows it. And almost as assuredly, in fact, I would say assuredly, especially since the 50s when the contactee movement started getting big and and people were very worried about it as a, as a nation and a culture and as, a, as, a, as the different military and intelligence institutions were worried that it somehow could be used against them, they definitely put plants into ufology circles. Now, I'm not going to start throwing shit around and saying, I know this ufologist is a plant, but for people to reject what seems to be really compelling evidence out of hand does not mean that that they are a shill for the CIA. It just could mean they have a different opinion or saw something I didn't. But you can't rule out the fact that there are some elements even that are celebrated within paranormal fields uh, that might not be exactly who you think they are. Ah, the old skeptical skeptors, huh? Those people? Well, you know, you know I don't it. think you're I don't yeah. think you're too far off, Rob. I think you you're really kind of onto something there. And it's it's overwhelming to think that the people we trust the most are actually the ones we should fear. You, you yeah, know, there seems to be a common theme I think that we're all experiencing on a pretty regular basis. So yeah, unfortunately, yeah, it's uh there was a documentary not that long ago, was it uh what The Mirage Men, I believe, on on Hulu, I think. Oh it may yeah, have about been. the guy that was a counterintelligence officer. Yes, allegedly, about... or is he still? Is he now? Who knows? Exactly. (laughs) That's exactly because because you watch it and like this guy goes and he interacts with the community and then it's and it's he's like playing kind of both sides of the fence just to kind of put disinformation out there. So yes, that is definitely. I mean, that's the fucking problem. You don't know. Well, exactly. I mean, people listen. People could very well listen to this conversation and be like, these three people, you know, Mark, Krista, and Rob are completely disinformation agents. The only one who's not is Chris because he's not there. So yeah, yeah, no, (laughs) yeah, Chris is stepping out. He he is integral. Integrity won't allow him to be here, and <laughs> yeah, his schedule that, and why. temperament. Yeah, We're far yeah, too drunk to be effective agents of anything <laughs> other than restocking a bar. So I'm yeah. not. I'm not worried about us. And That's I, what they know, want you to think. <laughs> it's, true. it's been iced tea all along in the bourbon bottle. Yeah, yeah, but no, that uh, that that video from Las Vegas though was definitely interesting. Um, and yeah. So what I want to what I want to get back to is the idea of intelligent light. So what I saw in a lot of the things that you put up and you and you did it the right way. You showed original footage, then you explained in detail what you did to modify it, which was usually simply contrast, um, not modifying the colors or anything. Please correct me if anything I'm saying is wrong, Krista. Okay. And and once you and once you you transform into this thing, then you point out the things you noticed. Now, granted, again, it gets it gets a, it's in there. It gets a little pixelated as the technology is going to. I mean, we have to remember that the first level of processing is through a cell phone or a camcorder or even a quality recorder, and then it's processed again through the computer. So there's bound to be some sort of artifacting. But again, as we've mentioned earlier, that does not delegitimize what you're seeing. And you're seeing things that seem to be, at least to me, like worm-like things, things that seem to undulate. Obviously, they aren't structured in the sense that we think of as structured craft, be it in our world a ship or a plane and whatever it might be on an extraterrestrial planet, a flying saucer, if you want to go with classic tropes. It seems to be that a lot of the things that were captured and a lot of things that you focused on uh, in your in your excellent documentary were things that, that were not limited um, by either a solid structure or or, or even it seems like by gravity or inertia itself, because they move, they undulate, and they seem, uh, I'll just end on this, very organic. Can you give me a little bit of what your take is? Well, you know, just listening to you talk about it right now, uh, I can already kind of feel myself reacting to it physically and psychologically to it because it was just so overwhelming. And I kind of, you know, I, I have kids, I have a life, I'm a human being. I, you know, I can't go on thinking about this stuff all the time and, and like ex- the existentialism of what this means. Sure. Um, so when I kind of go back there, I don't want to say it's like PTSD, but at the same time, it's like, oh my God, I don't like, it was, it's so crazy. It's so crazy. And I go out at night and I look up at the sky and it's like, how could this be? How could it be? And I think you make a really good point because I grew up 
watching UFO documentaries with everybody else. And we're told right that they're they're metallic flying saucers with humanoids as pilots, right? And we all kind of think that's the case. So yep. I see this video and there's no metallic craft of any kind. And I can guarantee you there is no humanoid creature inside of that craft flying. it. Absolutely no way. Um, and so I think that is going to be the hardest pill to swallow for most uh, UFO lovers because well, let's, they go it's, ahead, please. it's like a religion for them. It's a religion to think that there's the whole nuts beings. and bolts aspect of it. Yeah. And I'm here saying, no, I've never in my, after all the videos that I've edited, there's no metallic material craft in that sky. It is literally pure energy. It is an energy that is conscious. That's interesting. So what that brings us to now, now just to make this clear, and this is not a challenge. This is just me trying to, to pick your brain a little. Do you think that all uh, UFOs in the sense that they are, I, I mean, even I don't subscribe wholeheartedly at all to the extraterrestrial theory. Um, but do you think all UFOs are these energetic, possibly organic, intelligently controlled, either anomalous airborne entities or unidentified energetic objects? Or are some of them, do you think, perhaps more classically defined as crafts and that maybe they're both coexisting in the skies to varying degrees? Well, you know, one personal rule I have is that there is no such thing as absolutes. So just mm. because I'm looking at these videos that are just conscious light, right, or intelligent light, doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, crafts with aliens that crashed in Roswell. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying from what I've seen, mm -hmm. I don't have any evidence towards that. That's a good answer. I mean, I, not that I was, like I said, that wasn't a gotcha moment. It was just, yeah, yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's a multiverse <laughs> of huge possibilities. Why does it have to be anything specific? Why can't everything at least be slightly entertained? But you're right. One of the most neglected facets, and this is something you, uh, you brought up in your documentary, which I love, because obviously I'm an old school guy. I love reading my paper books, and even though, you know, the internet has proved to be somewhat <laughs> valuable. Yeah. yeah, I know. It, it chokes yeah. Mark up. Eight years <laughs> yeah. my junior and a thousand years removed in terms of how oh, anachronistic yeah. I am. It's amazing. Yeah, it's Rob's, amazing. Uh, Rob's lack of involvement in technology is a daily panic attack for me. The stuff so, of legend. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Anyway. What he lacks in technical skills, he makes up in personality. Exactly. <laughs> You're the sweetest, exactly. Krista. Thank he you. He does. <laughs> But I'm surrounded by books, and I have a huge cachet of books by one, and you mentioned him in your documentary, much to my joy, Ivan T. Sanderson, who had really interesting uh, theories about UFOs, one of which, and I'm going to paraphrase here, and, and that you talk about also in your documentary, is that these are uh, sort of energetic, I don't know if they're organic, but living sentient creatures that either were terrestrially in, evolved and, and ended up, you know, being ocean born, but can, you know, soar into the skies, thus making them USOs, unidentified uh, submersible objects or w whatever the S stands for. And, and, or that they were extraterrestrials that somehow migrated here and, and made home in our oceans. And I love the fact that you, you talk about, um, you know, this theory because he was definitely not popular in his day or indeed this day for, for believing that. Nobody is, right? But um, there's been actually quite a few people who kind of made that that theory. And it, it's the, the more we understand about our world, it's almost kind of silly to assume that there aren't living things in our atmosphere. And in fact, they've already proven that there are. Oh, there's um, billions there's, of bacteria. There's tons of things that actually <laughs> live. It is... Uh, what, what is it here? Um, the Earth, the Earth's atmosphere in cubic miles is, and I have got this from the internet and my own awesome calculator, um, and I'm I, and I'm going to be way off. So, uh, 142 trillion seven hundred eighty-two billion one hundred eighty-four thousand four hundred fifty-seven point four four. At least when I wrote this article back in the day, uh, cubic <laughs> miles. That is oceans upon oceans onto itself, and we know it's it's literally riddled with. Uh, with bacteria and very tiny life forms, and and we know that the ocean floor can uh, can allow life forms that can live in the most harsh conditions. Or as you mentioned in your documentary too, which is phenomenal about the uh, the globule of bacteria and madness that they found on the International Space Station that had managed to survive in the irradiated 
icy cold of space. So, uh, so, so why would we limit to our fascination to things that live either beyond our solar system or below our oceans? Why would we not consider the atmosphere just because I guess we think we can look up and see everything as a place for abundant life? I think you're I think you're definitely on to something there. I think a lot of people are. It's just it's just too it's too fantastical, I think, to believe. Even when I go outside and I look up at the sky on a normal every day and I'm like, there's no way. There's no way. There's jellyfish multidimensional things living in the sky that are bioluminescent oh, there is. and appear oh, at night. Me, there is. <laughs> you know, but then at the same time it's like, God, how else can I explain what these lights are? You know, why not? Why can't it be possible? Yeah, we actually, um, I mean, it was early on in our podcast, but we, I believe it was, we called it Sky Amoebas, right, Rob? Well, Mm. Trevor James Constable, I think, coined that. We talked about his ideas in, I believe, the Gargantuan Gliders episode, which, of course, became infamous for its fucking blimps. We'll leave that right there and not touch it again. Oh, yeah, because it was actually a crashing blimp. That's right. It was not, but that's not the point. (laughs) The point is, we did briefly discuss Trevor James Constable's uh, ideas. He definitely seemed to have to me an organic bias and the idea of these like amoebas that could come down even devour people occasionally which is a fascinating if not horrific idea and and a lot of the things that we see in these videos are clearly energetic in nature Um, i'm just wondering just as a pure opinion i know that there's not enough science or background to know but just where you're at right now if you lean either towards uh the sentient organic hypothesis or the something that's almost unfathomable for people, the sentient energetic hypothesis. You know, what, what if it's both, you know? Um, And I think the reason why he thought that they were living organisms is because they shared so many characteristics to amoebas. And that was one of the first things I noticed about the lights when you were talking about uh, what was one of the first things I saw that just really freaked me out. It was uh, Steve Barone's video. And you have this one light and then all of a sudden it, it turns into two. And then all of a sudden it comes back into one again. And so what is what it, what it reminded me of was um, cellular division. That's exactly how uh, they they evolve and and, and grow. Um, and so when I ran into Trevor James Constable's theory that these lights were amoebas in the sky, massive, massive amoebas in the sky, which is insane because to us, amoebas are microscopic, right? Right. So, and these things are huge. Um, and for my personal opinion, I'm going to say that is something that I do take into consideration. Um it's a little bit overwhelming to come up with. I, I think that this is what this is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but to be honest, I'm kind of leaning more towards um, an energy creature thing. <laughs> well, no, I mean, no, that's what you have no, to say. Way, you yeah, have to be vague because there's yeah. no concrete evidence. No one. Yeah. No one really knows. I mean, a part of me is like, I don't want to be walking out on whatever Mesa. If for some reason I'm ever at a Mesa um, and all of a sudden this giant sky me comes down and then devours me and I'm gone. I'd be much more comfortable with like, Oh, Hey, just some cool, like light being that's awesome. It's not going to devour me unless of course that light being all of a sudden materializes and then I'm no more. And then there we go. I mean, so, the sky yeah. is literally filled with macro single celled organisms that can treat us the way, you know, it, uh, you know, any amoeba would treat the, you know, random detritus and edibles that they're floating in the water with it. That would be a really fucking difficult world to live in. And I'm glad yeah, that if, can't... if that is the case, that it doesn't happen yeah. all that often. I don't have the emotional space to deal with that right now. Like, I really don't. I just can't deal with the idea of an amoeba from the sky eating me. And we've covered other <laughs> um, a- atmospheric creatures uh, as well. There was the, um, I-, I believe it was, uh, was it in Long Island, Rob, the sky spitter, right? Oh, yeah. A cloud-like yeah. object that decided to single out some poor science teacher and rain on him spit, with its just evil literally mouth. spit on him and then there was the other one that it, uh they were uh like, like sky rays that were chasing a car I, I i believe yeah maybe in long island i think so yeah 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 so so we've had stories about these and uh yeah it's terrifying and interesting and yeah, i, I mean hopefully they him, have he called them critters didn't he if i'm not wrong i think i think so which just yeah. somehow the homespun nature of it makes it even worse just makes mm-hmm. it even, even like just yeah. these little these little critters just nestling around in the sky coming down eat your flesh 
Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. <Yes. laughs> exactly. exactly. You know, when I was doing research for the documentary, I went to the uh, CIA website and I was reading some of the documents they have there. And they were talking about the lights in the sky and how they behave. And they actually used the word creatures, that they behaved like little creatures. Oh, and interesting. That was the the main thing I liked, I, I think. Uh, I, the main thing that I think is that the lights, and I, I could totally be wrong, right? But the lights, they don't care about humans. They don't care about us. They are literally living their own little world, their own little reality. I think they're aware of us. I think they can sense us. But from everything I've seen, they're kind of just doing their own thing. Right. So they're not like necessarily like, like they're not really interacting with anything. They're just kind of up there doing their doing whatever they want to do which opens right, up when, t- no go, go ahead. ahead you first krista please so when do they interact with us right when when is the the biggest time where they really started kind of evolving involving themselves with humanity and that's mm-hmm. when we started having the nuclear bombs right yes you bring that up that's very interesting no, can, and that, i mean uh, yeah no, well, the Arnold sighting is all I was going to say. You know, it's it's like right on the heels of the first atomic test, and of course, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And there's a lot of different takes on it. The, the, I think the traditionalist take would be um, that aliens from other cultures on different planets, wherever they be, maybe in our galaxy, saw that we had harnessed the atom. Certainly not mastered it in any way, but harnessed it and came down to check. I think that is the standard extraterrestrial hypothesis version of it. But as I mentioned in a a podcast not that long ago, uh, Gordon Creighton talking about the possibility of interdimensional creatures or creatures living on another version or plane of Earth being deeply affected by these nuclear tests, suddenly, all of a sudden, that really, to me, that the onus on dealing or at least knowing what's going on seems a lot more extreme if you are actively being threatened, not just as like some arbitrary thing, oh, look at that pop. Sorry, Japan. Now let's go down and see what humans are <laughs> yeah. doing. Yeah, you know, exactly. The, the exactly. fact that they might be affected somehow uh, in, intrigues me a lot. Yeah, I believe Man. I referred to that as inter, as uh, interdimensional pollution, where it's like, hey, guys, uh, we all share this space, and we don't really appreciate you testing bombs in the desert and dropping them on you know civilians and whatnot because it affects us all. Man. So, yeah, and that, you know, also, too, there is that theory that when the atom bomb was released, that it was somehow like, you know, a rip in the a, a rip in time and space, which sort of opened up, you know, our world to whatever else could be out there. Yeah, I like the fantastical philosophy. stuff. I really love the fantastical stuff. So to me, it's like, well, yeah, clearly the bomb went off and all of a sudden we open up a gate interdimensionally to everywhere. And now we just have new visitors. But that, that's my jam. So that's fun. I mean, it <laughs> so, is yeah, fun. You know, it's, it's what I do. But so, one of the things, so, yeah. Krista, that I, I like that you mentioned in your documentary that I was utterly unfamiliar with was uh, the, the segment you had about the uh, uh, British astronaut Helen Sharman, who uh, speculated that life could exist all around us but that they may be made of material that are invisible or at least undetectable by human beings. Isn't that like beautiful? The, I, I love that because I've, I always talk about it. I, I don't know if you ever saw, if you're a fan of 80s horror, but the movie From Beyond. That is my go-to analogy because they turned on this machine called the Resonator, these scientists, one mad, one less so as assistant. And that opened up the ability to perceive these places around us that were uh, – naked to the human eye based loosely on an hp lovecraft story so that aside you know whether or not you know the film is regardless what what i've always been fascinated with the idea we are literally surrounded by life that is just as unaware of us as we are of it but it's even just as fascinating to think that they might be very aware of us and the dumb shit that we do but that they are making a conscious effort not to bother because f those guys they're suicidal monkeys and who cares but uh, yeah. Well, but the idea that we're surrounded by life. Yes, please. Let's talk about the demographics of the UFO world. You're going to have your. Um, let's get the tinfoil hat people out of the way first, right? We all know that, that they would, exist. That would be me. In, Thank in, you. No, in, ev- <laughs> in every field of study, even legitimate ones, there's the tinfoil hat crowd. That is not singling right. out ufology, and I know right. she's not doing that. It's just yeah. anywhere you go, you're going to find the tinfoil hat crowd, period. Right. I'm, the paranoia I'm, I'm, and stuff yeah, like that. I'm right here, guys. <laughs> no, even even worse than you, Mark. I think. I would... oh, okay, good. <laughs> so you have you have the ones who who really are paranoid, maybe borderline schizophrenia, things like that. Okay, and I'm just being honest here. You know, from more of a scientific background. 
Right. And then you have the, 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 the alien lovers. These are extra, these are the greys and there's an alien battle and they came from Andromeda and they're here and they, they're tall and beautiful and blonde, you know, whatever theories that they have. And then the next theory that you have, and on my Facebook group lights in the sky, um, a lot of people are starting to join and a lot of people are starting to get a bit more vocal. And I would say the reigning, the reigning demographic right now is your, your religious folks. And you can't really talk about the lights in the sky without considering the references made in ancient texts. Mm-hmm. And it's overwhelming, right? Because it's, it, is it a weird coincidence? Can we, should we consider it? And as soon as you say the, world, the word UFO, right, you're discredited. But as soon as oh, you course. say the word God, you're discredited. As soon as you say the word Jesus or or, or Allah, right, you're discredited. But I think it's doing a disservice to the lights in the sky if we don't consider the the ancient texts. And if that's true, then the lights actually really do care about humanity, right? Um, and that's overwhelming because they taught, you know, are angels aliens? Are the was um, was Enoch carried away in a UFO. You know? It's pretty. It's pretty compelling that 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 might have happened. And what I find intriguing about about what you're saying in specific in scientific circles, you are absolutely right. It is taboo to mention UFOs theology in any way. Um, they're trying. They, they think they're trying to be hard and fast. And and I am a science believer, by the way. I am a person that believes in the scientific method and and thinks you should take it step by step. But I also. Uh, hate dogmatic thinking and, and and limiting perspectives. But the converse side to the divinity potential of UFOs and whether or not, say, Enoch was taken by <clears throat> these crazy four-headed aliens into space and thought they were forms of angels, which they may have been, I don't know, is mm. is what uh, Luis Elizondo, the, the former uh, lead in ATIP, who is now uh, part of the To the Stars Academy, um, he he said that one of the things that made him leave the Pentagon and protest and leave the project behind and like move into the private sector was the fact that there was a very large contingent of high up military officials in the Pentagon that refused to put any serious scientific, you know, secular study into UFOs because they thought all of ufology and all of the things involved were demonic and of literally hellish origin. And, and and that and it's not a joke. I'm not making this up. They, they, yeah, there's no, a huge I, contingent I, I of remember. our serious military leaders that are like, we don't even talk about UFOs. You don't look into it because they are demons in the sky piloting their hell chariots and they're <laughs> here to corrupt humanity. Obviously, right. I take that with a serious fucking grain of salt. But the fact that the man in charge of the program left in protest of that, among other things, to me is intriguing. So while I am open definitely to the possibility of there being a divine aspect to ufology, or at least uh, a a higher science, as Nick Cox, one of our you know one of our favorite uh, contributors, to this pod mentions this idea that it's just not qualified yet. That we see things that tried to help us out in the past, and and were magnanimous and awesome as divine. And why wouldn't you? I mean, any great benefactor you would see as such, and others that try to thwart you as diabolical. I, I find that. Uh, that while that possibility is definitely there and, and no one should close their mind to it, it makes it very difficult when um, when you're studying these things sometimes because when you when you mix belief with evidence searching, um, it, it almost always becomes a matter of I'm following the evidence to this location as opposed to I know this is my destination. Let me find the evidence that seems to indicate that's where we're going. Confirmation bias. That's a huge it's- psychological factor. Right. Yeah. And that, and that's just, but, oh no, go ahead, please. Well, and I, I think, I think it goes back to what I said at the beginning of our conversation about people are scared. I mean, really scared. I just had someone message me a few minutes ago and they're, they're, you know, or before we started talking about how scared they are and they asked me, do I know what it is? Like, what is it? Tell me what it is. I mean, they have to know because it's so it's existential. Right. And uh, for me, maybe I'm the weird one, but I'm happiest when I'm looking at the unknown. I'm happiest when I consider that there's more to our world than what we can see, touch, taste and hear. Right. Absolutely. But I can understand that other people find that very scary. Um, do I think that Jesus is coming again 
honestly, personally, no, I don't think that, right? I think that these lights have been here for thousands of years. They've been here since the beginning of humanity. They're not only in our ancient texts, but they're in our ancient art too, which is um, the, the earliest form of communication. Um, so I, I think that we definitely need to not, uh, you know, discredit religion. Definitely, I think it has something to offer. I personally Absolutely. don't think that they're evil lights. There's been no reference of evil lights in the sky coming down and eating people. Um, all the references in the ancient texts and now people who claim they've been abducted, whether or not they have been or not, I don't know. But the people who have claimed and stuff. It's always a message of peace. It's always a message of love. There's this one video um, that's going around on YouTube. It's a little older, maybe a few months, but um, it was the it was in Iraq, I think, or Iran. I think Iran. But they have footage of the Iranians just letting loose. I mean, shooting the hell out of this random light in the sky, and they hit it oh, over boy. and over and over and over <laughs> again, and the light never. It, it, it's like the, the the bullets go straight through the light, right? Doesn't it's like matter. the Battle you, of L.A. You remember that, like yes, that legendary yes. photograph of all the spotlights and all the people that were protecting the Pacific Coast in L.A. from a potential Japanese invasion, and you see the shells, and it's this gloriously blurry black and white photograph <clears throat> that's become iconic. But it's like yeah. the same thing. This thing never attacked back. It never tried to to harm any of the people. I mean, if anything, people were harmed by friendly fire, unfortunately, but, right. but it's, it, it reminds me of that same scenario. Like at, uh, there's all, that also that great old Iranian case with the uh, Colonel, whose name escapes me, but his, his case happened in the seventies and it was so famous. They actually had a made for TV movie. I think you can find it on, on YouTube. And he, actually engaged and locked on in his whatever fighter jet that he had at the time with an unidentified flying object. And at that point, all his controls were shut off. His, his weapons, his, his ability to steer, he was about to actually bail and eject. But when he turned away and made it clear that he was no longer an offensive threat, all the controls were returned to him and he was able to land safely. That to me is not the sign of an aggressor. That to me is the sign of someone saying, you're not going to shoot me, but, but I'm not here to hurt you either, dude. I get you're scared. You don't get it. Right. They yeah, could um, hurt us if they wanted to, and they don't. There would be the five-second war, except there'd be no historian to call it that because we'd all be fucking dead. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, basically. It's kind of um, – that actually brings me to the uh, – I believe it's the, the Nimitz footage that is, is also in your documentary. Obviously, very famous footage of the Tic Tac UFO. Right. Um, yeah, that's – you know, uh, Joe Rogan actually had uh, – I believe it was Lieutenant Favor. Is it Favor is the guy's name or Fravor? The, the actual Maybe guy that Fravor? engaged. Maybe Favor. I'm not sure. Yeah, he actually engaged the UFO. Uh, and something with that interview, um, and obviously this guy's been he's been interviewed by everybody. Uh, something that really stuck with me with that was that it was actively jamming his radar, like it, it knew. So not only you know mm -hmm. is this video, this is now evidence. This is now been the the Pentagon decided to release it in the middle of a pandemic. Excellent timing, guys. Sweet, you know. No, what uh, what, but, what 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 better way to be like put below the fold in the paper to yeah. use another. Anachronistic term. I mean, what better yeah. way to hide the knowledge than to release it during yeah, a it, pandemic? It was originally leaked, and then the To the Stars Academy got it. Obviously, everyone knows the story, but then the Pentagon comes out, and they're like, yeah, no, this is real. It, and there you go. Um, but getting back to what I was saying, that it was actively jamming his radar, and as he was trying to engage it, it was just outmaneuvering him. So that to me doesn't sound aggressive. Um, I mean, he again, he was trying to, to you know get to it to see what it was, and at no point did it actually engage it just jammed his radar and was like, sorry, guy, like, you know, this is what I do. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that, to be aware that footage actually, yeah, it's it, it, exactly. It, it, it was completely aware that he was there and mm -hmm. it just outmaneuvered him. And then was like, see you later. That footage actually mm -hmm. is something that when you watch that, that's concerning because mm -hmm. they say it's there. They don't know what it is. Well, you know, well, what? how can you not know what it is? And, and I, and, and, and please remember what you're about to say, uh, Krista, because I know I'm going to interject here. To me, it's the opposite of concerning because this thing could manhandle the airplanes mm -hmm. chasing it, the battleship and the, the you know aircraft carrier following it. It didn't. It simply jammed a stick. So I understand why if you were a mil you or I'm not belittling you, but are a military official concerned about, well, shit, our best weapons are no match. I get that like existential concern. But as just a, a citizen of the world, I'm like, oh. Well, this thing could own you. It didn't. It's probably got benevolent intentions. Yeah, I, uh, and it makes me wonder, do yeah. they want us to know 
that they're there? Or are they just kind of there and then we see them and they get annoyed and run away? Because they kind of do seem like they run away a lot. But other times they're just kind of sitting there hanging out, you know. I had one woman message me uh, last week and she says, uh, because, you know, I have that Facebook group and I like to edit videos that people post. It's fun. I mean, I don't normally get anything too crazy, but I, it's gotten to the point to where every video that I get for the most part, I I kind of already know what's going to be there, uh, because they all have the kind of same behavior, no matter where in the world they're filmed. And so this woman messages me last week and she says, there's a light above my house outside right now. And I was like, okay, now go, go, are you filming it? And she said, yeah, I'm filming it. So she sends it over to me. And there's just not enough light. I can see that there's something there, right. but I don't know if it was the quality of her her camera or something, but it just wasn't good enough footage for me to share publicly. But I knew that she was telling the truth. Um, mm-hmm. And so I said, I know this sounds crazy, but people have told me that you can communicate with these lights. And she writes back and she goes, I already did! Exclamation point. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, okay. So what happened? And she says, I just moved to the right and I sold it to move to the right with me and it moved to the right and I moved to the left and I was like, this is amazing and I'm so jealous. <laughs> you get to yeah, no doubt. So, <laughs> so basically what you just set yourself up for, Krista, is for me to send you a video of myself outside my home hammered, being like, Krista, look it's there it's following me i actually get a lot of those right (laughs) rob was wrong and and krista has to write back that is a street lamp mark you are shit-faced go in and take care of your children (laughs) yeah my kids Uh, are fine they know the truth (laughs) you know it's it's amazing how many people have seen these lights you know yeah oh yeah yeah, I, I I was checking out your, your Facebook group there, and there's quite a lot of people there that are that are witnessing this. I personally never have, but then again, my problem is is I don't look up to the sky enough. It's mm. my own deal. I just don't because after watching your documentary, actually, I did, I watched your documentary with, with my kids, um, which is great to actually be able to watch something with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I, and I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, I don't. You know, I'm for all the stuff that we do outside and whatever, and you know, our regular family activities. Like, we're just never out there just checking out the sky, like ever. We just never do it because we just don't. So I, I'm just not paying attention enough, I think, to even be able to see anything. Whereas I know that Rob and Chris, um, you know, have you, 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 Rob and Chris, you guys have actually seen stuff multiple times that. You yeah, know. just anomalous things. We I don't yeah, know what they are, lights. but they're not to strike weird lights you. in the sky and yeah, and things moving. So, so they yeah, say you can totally. communicate with them, right? Stephen Greer says it in his phone. Yes, and you can yep. just be like Google Map yourself, and they'll come to you. So I, I'm an early bird. I wake, I go to bed at like eight thirty, nine o'clock every night. I'm kind of, and I wake up super, super early. So I'm literally never awake at night. <laughs> um, but but sometimes That's... I am, and I go out and I'm like, okay. Stephen Greer said that I had to be pure of heart. <laughs> that I had to be. <laughs> yeah, not cult like at all. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't even get past that point. I'd be like, I know that I'm not pure. This Forgive sucks. Me. I'm going to get a terrible light. This light that I'm going to get is going to suck. It's going to be the worst light ever. Yeah. So gonna, I, I keep gonna Google come mapping myself. Stones. I'm not getting anything, you know. And I'm just like, maybe, maybe I'm a terrible that. person. I don't yeah, know. Work, work on the purity a little, Chris. <laughs> That's my uh, problem. That's yeah. my problem is I know I'm going to go out there like I'm pure of heart. And they're going to be like, no, you're not. I'm like, damn it. They got me. Well, yeah. you know, that, is, that makes me think interesting, about though. the grid theory, right? I'm like, well, maybe my suburb of Colorado isn't on the grid, right? I don't oh, know. That's right. yeah, well, the, let's, let's stop right here. It's here. a perfect chance and, and break down because one of the things I want to start getting into a little bit, and I know we meander, that is the nature of our podcast, but um, is the potential origin of these things and different theories. And one of the things that you talk about extensively in your documentary that really fascinated me, and you know, I knew about Ivan T. Sanderson's Wild Vortices and other people that had gridded out like you know paranormalists even though it sounds like i'm dismissing it but like even learned scholars that have tried to like grid out the world in terms of uh you know where energy flows from ley lines to whatnot can you talk to us a little bit about the uh the grid theory and how it uh how it how it maybe interacts with like the universal toroidal shape and and things of that nature because that part of your documentary i was really riveted to yeah, see, I can already feel my heart beating a little bit faster when you talk about it. I, you know, funnily enough, I don't really watch my documentary uh, 
one, because it's weird kind of seeing yourself like that. It's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> I can't watch anything I've ever made, especially if I'm in it. I agree. Yeah. It's a nightmare. Yeah. And two, because, you know, anyway, so there's some, there's a light I saw and I know you guys saw it cause you watched the documentary. I won't go too much into it, but there's, there's a, there's a light I saw and it is, it looks two dimensional. And I thought, how is it possible for this light, all these lights to look two dimensional? That's not how our world exists. So I Google search and, you know, they say, you know, Chrissy did such a great job researching this. And then at the same time, it's like, I just, it kind of just fell into my lap. I mean, at a certain point, it kind of felt like it was out of my hands. Like I was just following the breadcrumbs, you know, laid out before me. So I see these two dimensional grid lights. I Google two dimensional grid lights and all this information comes up about not just quantum physics, but previous um, ufologists who are saying that um, the lights appear on a grid. Uh, I don't know what, why and how, I don't think anybody really does, but it was just observations that multiple people have, have made. And then you go into quantum theory and quantum theory is like, in fact, our whole reality is a two dimensional hologram. And you're like, okay, so (laughs) how does this play? How does this play into the lights? Is it connected? I mean, really it's, it's so kind of beautiful, the information that we have, but I feel like nobody's really ever sitting down and putting the information together. How fucking amazing would it be? I'm going into speculative Rob mode now. If Mm -hmm. the ascension (laughs) of consciousness isn't necessarily a a paradise environment or any of the things that we've been taught theologically, or even an aggrandizement of what we know, though it would be, but it's a simplification into two dimensions. If a two dimensional existence is closer to what reality actually is and we in our limited perceptions perceive ourselves to be in a three-dimensional world how fascinating would it be to ascend to two dimensions which would seem to be counterintuitive but just i mean but then you know it's the simulation and then you function in that i mean i don't know now i'm just obviously i am pissing in the wind which is my favorite no, thing to do theoretically yeah, but yeah <laughs> <laughs> see Rob, see Rob. That's why I can't like vape weed around you because then you'll mm-hmm. say that, and then I'll get really paranoid, <laughs> and things are gonna get. I'm gonna like lock myself in my truck with my weed vape and be like, yeah. if I get higher, it'll make sense. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. Weed always <laughs> answers the questions we need most, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. True, true. Until you until you get too deep, and then Rob says that, and you're like, oh no, the paradigm has shifted, and I'm on the wrong side. Yeah. And then there you go. Everything's yeah. a downhill spiral from there. So. Well, you know these lights were in two dimensions and we live in three dimensions or four dimensions if you consider time <clears throat> but then the quantum theorists are saying there's 11 dimensions what the hell does that look like Dude, that's, you know? the, that's the string theory so bad and though yeah. i can't and though i can't math i cannot math at all i call it math no. because that's what it, i cannot at all and i can barely <laughs> physics just barely like like i can watch nova and occasionally say i think i no i don't I don't understand what you're saying at all. That's that's my knowledge of it. But the idea of string theory, and again, this is something of all the fascinating like notions that you go into and, and, you know, you own the fact that you don't have an idea, which again, I mean, you have ideas, but that you don't have an answer, which I love because that's what truly uh, being inquisitive is about not claiming you have an answer. You don't have, but presenting the evidence and letting people get to it. And one of the things you talk about, one of the things that's always fascinated me is the idea of string theory. And that is, in the barest of nutshells, the idea that we, uh, the existence of everything is essentially vibrations mm-hmm. that manifest from, like you say, the 11 dimensions, the math works out. I don't know how I just trust them. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. then, and that, and that be basically like, and you have Michu Kaku in your documentary discussing it, um, uh, that, that, we, you know, we are all basically harmony and melody at the most foundational level and that these quarks and other subatomic particles are really just these things vibrating at such a rate that they appear to have three-dimensional shape. And in a way, that does not seem inhibiting to me. That does not seem terrifying to me. It seems like, oh my God, that's beautiful. And if we are all essentially music Sometimes discordant, like the best of punk rock, sometimes harmonious and beautiful, like the greatest of old composers, then then to me, there's something really wonderful about that. And if there is something to that, if these objects in the sky, at least some of them, are these sentient manifestations of this, this two-dimensional uh, 
symphony that is continuously going on around us and, in fact, makes up the entire universe as we know and don't know it, there is something really kind of eloquent and and beautiful about that. I agree. I had a friend who lost someone very close to her last week, and it was very oh, overwhelming, very so sad. Sorry. And, 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 you know, I think people are afraid and existential and scared because we're all immortal, right? We're all trying to understand what the hell reality are we living in? How do we get through every fucking day? You know what I mean? Well, yeah, totally. Yeah, uh, and, yeah that's my existence right yeah, there for the last yeah, especially 40 now, years of my life. Especially yeah. now in oh quarantine. My God. Jesus oh Christ, my, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with my kids? Head. Lord help me. God, <laughs> oh, yes. Believe me. Oh, yeah, my God. I gotta, my son's nine and my daughter's six. Believe me, I'm tired of answering questions. Oh, my Thank God. God. My you... son is nine and my daughter is six. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. There you fun go. Ages, Perfect. Fun ages. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but it makes you think. It makes you think, God, you know, it's so beautiful. And I, I definitely don't want to go down that uh, that depressing path. But it does make you think about the beauty of, of what that means, you know, on a bigger scale. I yeah, agree definitely. completely. As definitely. a man whose shadow has been existential crisis since he was pre-K, I absolutely appreciate <laughs> the idea <laughs> that there is some harmonious <laughs> logic that is going on in the <clears throat> And in the, in the, in the vastness of it, because trying to understand the world piecemeal, I'm not going to digress too deeply, is a fool's errand and it will drive you mad. Now, if you're happy in your little catacomb, do it. Rock on. I got no beef with it. But if you can see beyond it and you're trying to stuff yourself in, you're making a tragic error. That doesn't mean, you know, lack credulity and just buy everything and that that is espoused to you. Of course not. But be open and go out and explore. Done with the PSA on that. Where mm-hmm. I want to go now is... Um, Something you were, that was talked about a little bit, and and that is, uh, in the Big Bang, uh, talked about in your documentary. That is, matter and mm-hmm. antimatter were created in equal parts, but mm-hmm. you know physicists find today that it's really difficult to find. And some have speculated that it might actually be existing in another reality. But they've been doing tests now. I don't know if it was at CERN <clears throat> or where, but where they were able to detect the antimatter's basically existence. Um, through directed light. I know I don't expect you to be an expert on this at all, mm-hmm. even, you know, because, mm-hmm. we, we, you know, I'm not. So I'm wondering now if there's a possibility that these 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 lights, which dis- really do appear to be sentient and do appear to move again, like inchworms or other like simple organic life forms on Earth, if maybe they could be glimpses into literally another reality, for lack of a better term, and and that they and that we they are manifesting in light so that we can occasionally see them and that might be part of the reason why they don't seem generally speaking to interact with humans at all like you were saying earlier just they see they're doing their own thing they don't seem to particularly want our attention sometimes they want to avoid it but generally speaking they're just doing their thing maybe mm-hmm. we're just catching little glimpses into that do you have any uh, i don't know any any thought on that matter That's actually my number one opinion. That's what I believe. I, again, I don't know. I don't believe in the grays. I'm, 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 you know, I think maybe the angels in theology are maybe the the only way they could comprehend and communicate what they were seeing. But I personally do believe that, um, anti, there's another reality, another dimension that we share. It's not in some faraway galaxy, but all around us. And by changing their frequency, they're able to show themselves through us. And as you learn in the documentary, that's only done through light. Um, and it's it's coming to 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 people now that light really is the only form of communication between both realities. And there's video of people who I don't know. I don't recommend it. I've never done it myself. I don't know if it causes harm, but I've seen videos of people who have these high grade lasers and they shine them at the lights in the sky and they respond to it. And that's, that's amazing. amazing. Can we play huh. with that? Can we go there? Yeah, totally. You know? So oh, I, yeah, I do think, up? I do think that. Did you accidentally use your laser pointer that you used to play with your cat and throw a, you, your mama joke into another fucking reality? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. Did yeah. it start trouble? I mean, if I mean you that's the thing you always have to worry about there. because <laughs> if it's another reality and anything is sentient and it's not, if it's, if it's evolved anywhere at the level we are, boy, you know, even I find, and this is a universal trope, but in texting, not understanding the nuance can throw people for a loop. 
So, so mm -hmm. if, if communicating <laughs> with another reality <laughs> through a beam of light might be a wonderful way to establish, like, I'm here, you're there. Hey, let's be awesome. Or it might also be a way to be like, well, fuck. I just started mm -hmm. the yeah, I interdimensional just sent the wrong, war. And, uh, I just sent the wrong emoji, and now I, I, they're I really just, pissed. I just mm -hmm. killed the Archduke Ferdinand of this realm, and yeah. here comes the trenches. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's interesting though the the uh, the communication with light, especially with you know how we you know view color and see everything in a spectrum and whatnot. Um, but yeah, no, I think you know I think that is uh, that's a great that that's a interesting theory. And uh, what I really liked too about your documentary is when you do you know, not to give spoiler alerts or whatever, but you are very open to every possibility, and you're very you're very much like, look, this is the possibilities that we have, and you're not nailing anyone down. So it is kind of cool that you that you you are leaving it open to different interpretations, you know. Of and you know, like I said at the beginning, that was a very conscious decision for me. Um, because Which I think I wanted, was really smart. Yeah. Yeah, and if it wasn't for the Facebook group and the way they attacked me, I never would have considered it. I would have been like, right. guys, oh my god, look at this! This is amazing, you know. Exactly. Instead, I was like, okay, all right, I have to be gentle here. I have to be soft here. I can't leave any room for a misinterpretation. I have to be very right. concise, and I have to say it in a way that anyone can understand it because I do delve mm -hmm. into some deep scientific thought. But I, I want it to make it so anyone could watch it, anyone could understand, and if they wanted to go deeper into their own research, <clears throat> then they could, right? Yeah, totally. Which is so the best excited. way to do it. And way to yeah. take mm -hmm. adversity and turn it into a positive. And I, I just a, a, a side note, some of the, the stills you had were phenomenal. These, mm -hmm. I, this is the last subject I want to touch on. These beautiful insect shapes and other geometric things, which really, mm -hmm. you know, being an, in, you know, an old, you know, guy now in remembers arcades reminded me of like the aliens and Galaga, just these, these like simple, geometric shapes that were mm -hmm. it, it, maybe it's pareidolia maybe it's reality what they are but that they mm -hmm. manifest in what seem to be tributes and or reflections of and or the actuality of but through a a, a dimensional barrier that i can't interpret it other than in two dimensions um representations of, of or primal organic creatures in fact th and the most manifest on the earth is insects and it wouldn't surprise me at all if an alien culture would have evolved from something like that and would be more interested in the true rulers of the earth which is bugs you do not imply this in any way this is me again running mm -hmm. running out way past I love it. my tether that's the whole point i wanted you to do this this is great <laughs> and, and, and i'm fascinated by it. that idea I, I i love it and i i also love again the idea that you know i am interested in the idea of extraterrestrial uh life and particularly intelligences and i am interested in interdimensional and i'm interested in tons of stuff that's why we do this podcast but uh, but the thought that we are literally inundated with mm -hmm. life that we might not be able to detect that sometimes manifests itself in a, you know, in a visible spectrum that can be seen and recorded, but is very difficult to interpret even, you know, with, you know, the, the highest quality of editing gear, but still bears, you know, inspection. That idea just makes this world uh, seem less lonely, and it seems like yes. we've always we always treat the human races in every UFO documentary you see. You, you, it's always like you know, as far as we know, we are the only planet with life. The yeah. world, the universe, <laughs> might be a barren <laughs> hole full of shit and nothing and regret. And you know, we're great, and America's better, and and, and I'm a patriot, so that's fine. And yeah. you know, there's monkeys and us and bugs and fuck it. Yeah. But why not have a fucking universe <laughs> chock full of sentient glory? life that, oh, that can occasionally interact with us i mean to me i take great comfort from that thought i don't know if it's what the reality is and and and, and as you clearly indicated again as a credit to you we will probably never know the answer but that doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue them mm. exactly you know, yeah we can't study we're never going to catch a light you can't catch a light but we can study and learn more about how it behaves. And I do, I honestly really do think that if more people actually admit that this is true, that this is actually happening, I'm so sick and tired of, of having to convince people of something that's so obvious, you know? So once we can convince people that, yes, it's true, okay, can we move on now? And then we can start studying it like actual scientists, like the gift that humans have been given and actually use it, then I do think that we can understand more about the lights. Hear, hear. You're absolutely yeah, right. Definitely. And, and while mm -hmm. our generation might not live to see it, 
yours and Mark's children and my, you know, nieces and nephew, they might well get there because I think it's like 80 something percent of at least Americans say they believe in this stuff. You have the Pentagon, even though it has been downplayed because of a pandemic, basically admitting mm-hmm. to the existence of unknowns, whether or not, you know, they're using it to conceal something else. I don't know, but it's still a monumental leap forward in terms of um, official, re- you know, revelations and acknowledgement. And I think it's getting to the point where, especially because so many like Fravor and other uh, legitimate sources have come out, regardless of what their perspectives may be on what the origin is, they've come out and said, yes, this phenomenon is real. I think we are inching, and maybe it's just wishful thinking on my part, closer to a culture where at least you're not stigmatized for taking the time to look into it and rigorously study it. And we're, and we're mm-hmm. even though we're still a culture that stigmatizes and we're still a culture that poo-poos things and speaks of little green men and dumb shit like that. Mm-hmm. By and large, the mass of humanity is moving towards a place where it's like, hey, there's something there. I don't know what it is. Let's try to figure it out. And I hope at least, uh, you know, if we don't get there, that the kids we know and love do. And uh, and mm-hmm. I'm very optimistic on that on that front. It is worth looking into. I mean, and I'm open to a world where there are some structured craft, where there are sentient, energetic either beings or objects. I Why not? The universe is vast. And the more we find <clears throat> out, which is always what blows my mind, we never stop learning. We never have it all. The more we find out, the more expansive this universe gets. Why is it that at every point we are as a species, we're like, well, we got it. Fuck it. We got it. It's nailed. Mm-hmm. It's done. We know it. And it's <laughs> like, done. oh, wait, we it's found over. this other fucking thing out, and it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I want awesome. sweet well, video theory- games from another dimension. <laughs> yeah, same here. Exactly. But my Please, theory Krista. is that people are afraid, but there might be more reasons. I think, you know, unfortunately, you know, I told you I'm really into psychology and personality and uh, I know that a lot of people genuinely don't like to think about things and I don't, and they're, they're okay with that. They admit it and they're okay with that. They don't really like to think about more than what's absolutely necessary. And the fact of the matter is statistically, those people make up 80% of our society. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, are they're people not afraid? looking to rock the boat. You know, I think that maybe they're just afraid, but maybe they just don't care. Maybe they just don't care. Um, can we make them care? Uh, I don't know. I don't think you can make someone care. I think they have to care on their own. And I'm hoping that by sharing this information in a way that's easily digestible, that maybe in some small way, I can plant a little latent, a little latent um, interest in their brains, you know, that just a little seed that can grow. And who knows, maybe in this generation, maybe in the next, that seed will grow. Absolutely. Awesome. There you have it. Krista, thank you so much. That was a perfect ending to an awesome conversation. Um, oh, so real quick, your documentary is coming out, I believe, on June 23rd, correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it is available on iTunes. It is Lights in the Sky. Um, mm-hmm. Will it be available on anywhere other than iTunes or just yes, iTunes? Yes. I have a list. I need to look it up. I'm so terrible. Uh, iTunes, Google Play, Vimeo, Vudu, Microsoft, <clears throat> Xbox Video. So there's definitely lots of options for everybody. Um, and I'm super excited. I want people to have a discussion. If you guys are interested, uh, join the Facebook group, Lights in the Sky. Uh, people are f- sharing their videos, their experiences, and their pictures. And we we can discuss it and I can even edit the videos and we can all kind of come together and really discuss what's happening. Yeah, totally. That Actually, is... in the description of this podcast, we will put a link to all of your uh, social media so that people can interact and check that out. The beauty of the awesome. 21st century, and I was fucking, uh, obviously, I was born in the 1970s in this archaic <laughs> age where I would watch, say, In Search of or uh, Project UFO and be like, oh, and maybe be able to talk to my parents who <clears throat> barely indulged me, God bless them. And, and now we have a world where you can see something or be intrigued by something and interact directly with the documentarian, other eyewitnesses. It is really one of the beautiful beautiful boons of the 21st century and uh i encourage all our listeners to take advantage of it because the more we know and the more we're exposed to the better off we're going to be the broader our perspectives potentially can be and i I think it's great and again congratulations chris on you know following you know facing adversity turning it into a tangible documentary and and getting it released which is a huge feat an incredible Mm -hmm. yeah it's awesome and someone who knows a little bit about the process and uh and we wish you the very best of luck with it and thank you for talking with us because this was really was as mark said a fascinating conversation thank you rob i genuinely enjoy talking to you guys so thank you
You're Excellent. Welcome. Thank you so very much, Krista. And again, everybody, that is June 23rd, Lights in the Sky. Look for that documentary wherever you get your digital downloads. I am sure it will be there. We will have links in the description of this podcast. Um, Instas, the Twitters, and the Facebooks, obviously check us out there. We will have links to all of Krista's uh, Instas and Twitters and Facebooks in the description as well. So, uh, yeah, Krista, thank you so very much. And we'll be talking with you soon. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. <laughs> that was the best buy ever for the for the record, Krista. <laughs> Seriously, in the history of this podcast, was, that was the yeah. best buy ever. I was like, should I we say normally, something or not? I don't know. Yeah, no, no. You, you <laughs> this is actually still well. <laughs> yeah, this is actually still recording, which is the best okay. part. We always get people at the end. We're like, you're still recording. Oh, nice. Krista wins nice. the day. All right, see y'all later. Peace. Bye. <laughs>